Hello everyone, my name is Karima. Today I'll be reading Tuesdays with Mori. It's a story about a young man and an old man. The young man is struggling in his life when he meets the old man, that is his professor. Almost after 20 years, he learns life's greatest lessons. So let's see what happens, starting with the first chapter, that is the curriculum. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his house by a window in the study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink leaves. The class met on Tuesdays. It began after breakfast. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. No grades were given, but there were oral exams each week. You were expected to respond to questions and you were expected to pose questions of your own. You were also required to perform physical tasks now and then, such as lifting the professor's head to a comfortable position or placing his glasses on the bridge of his nose, kissing him goodbye or any extra credit. No books were required, yet many topics were covered, including love, work, community, family, aging, forgiveness, and finally, death. The last lecture was brief, only a few words. A funeral was held in lieu of graduation. Although no final exam was given, you were expected to produce one long paper on what was learned. The paper is presented here. The last class of my old professor's life had only one student. I was the student. It is the late spring of 1979, a hot, sticky Saturday afternoon. Hundreds of us sit together, side by side, in rows of wooden folding chairs on the main campus lawn. We wear blue nylon, nylon robes. We listen impatiently to long speeches. When the ceremony is over, we throw our caps in the air and we are officially graduated from college. The senior class of Brandeis University in the state in the city of Walhattan. For many of us, the curtain had just come down on childhood. Afterward, I found Maury Schwartz, my favorite professor, and introduced him to my parents. He is a small man who takes small steps as if a strong wind could at any time whisk him up. In his graduation day robe, he looks like a cross between a biblical prophet and a Christmas elf. He has sparkling blue-green eyes, thinning silver hair that spills on its forehead, big ears, a triangular nose, and tufts of green eyebrows. Although his teeth are crooked and his lower ones are slanted back, as if someone had once punched them in. When he smiles, it's as if you would just told him the first joke on earth. He tells my parents how I took every class he taught. He tells them, you have a special boy here. Embarrassed, I look at my feet. Before I leave, I hand my professor a present. A tan briefcase with initials, with his initials on the front. I bought this the day before at a shopping mall. I didn't want to forget him. Maybe I don't want him to forget me. Mitch, you're one of the good ones. He says, admiring the briefcase. Then he hugs me. I feel his thin arms around my back. I'm taller than he is. And when he holds me, I feel awkward. I feel older, as if I were the parent and he were the child. He asks if I'll be in touch, and without hesitation, I say, of course. When he steps back, I see that he's crying. The next chapter, that is, the slavers. His death sentence came in the summer of 1994. Looking back, Maury knew something bad was coming, long before that. He knew it the day he gave up dancing. He had always been a dancer, my old professor. The music did not matter. Rock and roll, big band, the blues. He loved them all. He would close his eyes and with a blissful smile begin to move 
to his own sense of rhythm. It wasn't always pretty. But then he did not worry about a partner for he danced by himself. He used to go to the church in Harvard Square every Wednesday night for something called Dance Free. They had flashing lights and booming speakers and Maury would wander in among the mostly student crowd wearing a white t-shirt and black sweatpants and a towel around his neck. And what a music was playing, that's the music to which he danced. He would do the lendy to Jimi Hendrix. He twisted and twirled. He waved his arms like a conductor on amphetamines. Until sweat was dripping down the middle of his neck. No one there knew he was a prominent doctor of sociology with years of experience and several well-respected books. They just thought he was just some old nut. Once he, brought, once he brought a tango tape and got them to play it on the, over the speakers. Then he commanded the floor, shooting track back and forth like some hot Latin lover. When he finished, everyone applauded. He could have stayed in that moment forever. But then the dancing stopped. He developed asthma in his 60s. His breathing became labored. One day he was walking along the Charles liver, liver and a cold burst of wind left him choking for air. He was rushed to the hospital and injected with adrenaline. A few years later, he, be he began to have trouble walking. At a birthday party for a friend, he stumbled inexplicably. Another night, he fell down the steps of a theatre, startling a small crowd of people. Give him air, someone, someone yelled. He was in his 70s by this point, so they whispered old age and held him to his feet. But Moray was always more in touch with his insides than the rest of us, knew something was wrong. This was more than old age. He was weary all the time. He had trouble sleeping. He dreamt he was dying. <coughs> he began to see doctors, lots of them. They tested his blood. They tested his urine. They put a scope up his rear end and looked inside his intestines. Finally, when nothing could be found, one doctor ordered a muscle biopsy. Taking a small piece out of Maury's scarf, the lab report came back suggesting a neurological problem. And Maury was brought in for yet another series of tests. In one of those tests, he sat in a special seat as they zapped him with electrical current, an electrical chair of sorts, and studied his neurological responses. We need to check this further, the doctor said, looking over his results. Why? Mori asked. What is it? We are not sure. Your times are slow. His times were slow? What did that mean? Finally, on a hot humid day in August 1994, Maury and his wife Charlotte went to the neurologist's office and he asked them to sit before he broke the news. Maury had a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, a brutal, unforgiving illness of the neurological system. There was no known cure. How did I get it? Maury asked. Nobody knew. Is it terminal? Yes. So I'm going to die? Yes, you are, the doctor said. I'm very sorry. He sat with Maury and Charlotte for nearly two, min two hours, patiently answering their questions. When the doctor left, the doctor gave them some information on ALS, little pamphlets, as if they were opening a bank account. Outside, the sun was shining and people were going about their business. A woman ran to put money in the parking meter. Another carried groceries. Charlotte had a million thoughts running through her mind. How much time do, have, do we have left? How will we arrange? How will we pay the bills? My old professor, meanwhile, was stunned by the normalcy of the day around him. Shouldn't the world stop? Don't they know what has happened to me? 
but the world did not stop. It took no notice at all. And as Moray pulled weakly on the car door, he felt as if he was dropping into a hole. Now what? he thought. As my old professor searched for answers, the dizzy took him over, day by day, week by week. He backed the car out of the garage one morning and could barely pu push the brakes. That was the end of his driving. He kept tripping, so he purchased a cane. That was the end of his walking free. He went for his regular swim at the YMCA, but found he could no longer undress himself. So he hired his first home care worker, a student named Tony, who helped him in and out of the pool and in and out of the bathing suit. In the locker room, the other swimmers pretended not to stare. They stared anyhow. That was the end of his privacy. In the fall of 1994, Maury came to the Hilly Brandes campus to teach his final college lecture. He could have skipped this, of course. The university would have understood. Get your affairs in order, but the idea of quitting did not occur to Maury. Instead, he hobbled into the classroom, his home for more than 30 years. Because of the cane, he took a while to reach the chair. Finally, he sat down, dropped his glasses off his nose, and looked out at the young faces who stared back in silence. My friends, I assume you are all here for the social psychology class. I have been teaching this course for 20 years. And this is the first time I can say there is a risk in taking it. Because I have a fatal illness, I may not be able to live to finish this semester. If you feel this is a problem, I understand. If you wish to drop the course, he smiled. And that was the end of a secret. ALS is like a lit candle. It melts your nerves and leaves your body a pile of wax. Often it begins with the legs and works its way up. You lose control of your thigh muscles so that you cannot support yourself standing. You lose control of your trunk muscles so that you cannot sit up straight. By the end, if you are still alive, you are breathing through a tube in a hole in your throat, while your soul, perfectly awake, is imprisoned inside a limb husk, perhaps able to blink or cluck a tongue like something from a science fiction movie. The man frozen inside his own flash. This takes no more than five years from the day you contract the disease. Maury's doctor suggested he had two years left. Maury knew it was less. But my old professor had made a profound decision. Once he began to construct the day, he came out of the doctor's office with a sword hanging over his head. Do I wither off, wither up and disappear or do I make the best of my time left? He had asked himself. He would not with her. He would not be ashamed of dying. Instead, he would make his death his final project, the center point of his days. Since everyone was going to die, he could be of great value, right? He could be research, a human textbook, study me in my slow and patient demise, watch what happens to me, learn with me. Maury would walk the final bridge between life and death and narrate the trip. The fall semester passed quickly. The pills increased. Therapy became a regular routine. Nurses came to his house to work with Maury with ring legs to keep the muscles active, bending them back and forth as if pumping water from a well. Massage specialists came by once a week to soothe the constant. Heavy stiffness he felt. He met with meditation teachers and closed his eyes and narrowed his thoughts until his world shrunk down to a single breath, in and out, in and out. One day, using his cane, he stepped onto the curb and fell over the street. The cane was exchanged for a walker. As his body weakened, the back and forth to the bathroom became too exhausting. 
so Maury began to urinate into a large beaker. He had to support himself as he did this, meaning someone had to hold the beaker while Maury filled it. Most of us would be embarrassed by all this, especially at Maury's age. But Maury was not like most of us. When some of his close colleagues would visit, he would say to them, Listen, I have to pee. Would you mind helping? Are you okay with that? Often, to their own surprise, they were. In fact, he entertained a growing, growing stream of visitors. He had discussion groups about dying, what it really meant, how society had always been afraid of it, without necessarily understanding it. He told his friend that if they really wanted to help him, they would treat him not with sympathy, but with visit, phone call, a sharing of their problems, the way they had always shared their problems. But Maury had always been, and Maury had always been a wonderful listener. For all that was happening to him, his voice was strong and inviting, and his mind was vibrating with a million thoughts. He was intent on proving that the word dying was not synonymous with useless. The new year came and went. Although he never said to anyone, Maury knew this would be the last year of his life. He was using a wheelchair now. And he was fighting time to say all the things he wanted to say to all the people he loved. When a colleague at Brandis died suddenly of a heart attack, Maury went to his funeral. He came home depressed. What a waste, he said. All those people saying all those wonderful things. And I never got to hear any of it. Maury had a better idea. He made some calls. He chose a date. And on a cold Sunday afternoon, he was joined in his home by a small group of friends and family for a living funeral. Each of them spoke and paid tribute to my old professor. Some cried, some laughed. One woman read a poem. My dear and loving cousin, your ageless heart, as you move through time, layer on layer, tender square. Maury cried and laughed with them. And all that heartfelt things we never get to say to those we love. Maury said that day, his living funeral was a rousing success. Only Maury wasn't dead yet. In fact, the most unusual part of his life was about to unfold. Thank you so much. I'll be reading the next chapter very soon. So stay tuned and thank you for listening. And I hope you're doing well.